Before we read this morning's scripture, let's do a quick Bible study. Luke 3.3 3 says that John the Baptist proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now the word repent, it means to turn around, to change directions. But that word repentance is the English translation of the Greek word metanoia. You can translate the word to another word, but it's not as easy to capture the original meaning. Metanoia means to change your whole way of thinking. A baptism of changing your whole way of thinking for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so let's look at the words forgiveness and sins. Forgiveness is translated from a Greek word that means to let go, and sins from a Greek word that means to miss the mark. So let's put it all together. He went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of changing your whole way of thinking for the letting go of missing the mark. Or, he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of changing your whole way of thinking in order to quit missing the mark. Now, here are these words that come from the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke, starting with the first verse. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's just the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Loving God, as you grant us your peace, Encourage us to be peacemakers this day and always. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't think it's any mistake that when music stops, sirens start, and our prayers stop, and sirens are still going, such is the nature of the way things are going these days and the world into which the Christ child is to be born. Today, on the second Sunday of Advent, we light this candle of peace. And so, what does that mean? What is peace? I was looking at Dorothy Thompson's quotes to, to shed some light on this for us. Dorothy Thompson says, Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of creative alternatives for responding to conflict. Alternatives to passive or aggressive responses. Alternatives to violence. Okay? Racism and racist systems are violent, yes? A friend of mine was at a grocery store recently and she noted, noticed this inexpensive baby doll with a pretend bottle and she thought for a second about buying it for her daughter because her little girl loves baby dolls. But then she says, I zoomed out and my, I zoomed out my focus, and, and I realized that every single doll there with their various sizes, accessories, and price points were white. And my friend made an assessment then. She said, this store can hire a person of color to check my groceries, but they can't sell a doll that looks like her. We need to do better. I share this example as an act of peacemaking. Zooming out is an active choice to see things differently and to think about things in a different light. A whole new way of thinking spurs peacemaking. 
Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of creative alternatives for responding to conflict. Alternatives to passive or aggressive responses, alternatives to violence. As Jesus teaches us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. I served as the officiant for a, a wedding this past weekend in Austin, and I snuck off to one of my favorite music venues on Friday night, the Cactus Cafe. And as the musician got to the stage and he was tuning his guitar, he looked out in the audience and he said, uh, it's been a peculiar year. And somebody hollered back from the crowd, how so? And he said, well, has anybody killed somebody today? This is our cycle of violence. These are the circumstances into which the Christ child is born on Christmas Day, one that goes from singing to sirens, from prayer to sirens. So what are we doing to prepare the way for this love of God that is freely given to the whole world? If we are supposed to prepare the way for Christ by repenting so that we would usher in the forgiveness of sins, then how are we changing our way of thinking about this ongoing cycle of gun violence that is obviously missing the mark. Gary Slutkin is a former epidemiologist for the World Health Organization, and he's also the founder and executive director of Cure Violence. And he argues that we can stop the spread of violence by using methods and strategies that are associated with disease control. But he says, this will require a change in our whole way of thinking. In an interview that he gave just a few days ago in the wake of San Bernardino, the shootings there, Gary Slutkin suggested that violence is a contagious disease because it fits the characteristic signs and symptoms. It causes death and disability, and it's contagious because each instance of it leads to more violent events. Violence begets violence. His organization, Cure Violence, uses outreach workers called interrupters to detect unusual events and to prevent their spread. He says, guns are everywhere, and because weapons are so easy to access, cure violence is more concerned with people, situations, and circumstances where violence grows. And because we let people know that we're health workers, working in everybody's interest, working for the common good, People will readily give us information about their friends and, and their family and their community when things are out of sorts. And our experience with this in U.S. cities, he says, as well as in Latin America, Africa, and even in southern Iraq, show us that we can get 40 to 70 percent drops in violent events by viewing and handling violence as a health problem that affects us all. So instead of our communities falling on either side of a politically framed argument. Either we demand stricter gun control from our political leaders, or we exercise our alleged Second Amendment rights with vigilance by carrying guns and responding to violence as we spot it. Instead of putting ourselves in those boxes, we could be zooming out to see this whole mess as a contagious health problem and then actively equipping people to be health workers trained to cut violence off before it becomes inflamed in any capacity. And Gary Slutkin says, we could do this tomorrow. We could act on this alternative tomorrow. But it would require a change to our whole way of thinking about violence itself, to see it as a disease. He says, changing thinking and changing behavior is the bread and butter of the health sector. Well, John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth teach and demonstrate that changing thinking and changing behavior is the bread and butter of Christianity. It's the essence of peacemaking that forgives us from sins of violence that we commit against one another. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. paraphrases the words from the prophet Isaiah that are also paraphrased by John the Baptist. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be, er, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. All flesh, all people, 
Every precious human being will see the relentless love and salvation of God. And see, what Dr. King does by paraphrasing those words, all flesh shall see us together, is he's reminding us of our shared responsibility, our communal commitment to justice. It's about us. As we repent, as we choose alternatives from the present ways of thinking about everything from gun violence to our Muslim neighbors to the mass incarceration system to the Black Lives Matter movement to undocumented immigrants living in the shadows of our everyday lives to the poor and marginalized in our midst, that reorientation enables us to see, all of us together, to see God's salvation and God's grace and God's relentless love for this world and for everybody. And so we let go of in different ways of looking at the people and the world around us and we start working together for justice and for healing and for peace. We start hitting the mark of God's dream for this world instead of missing it. This is our good news. And to me, the best part of that good news is who it comes to. The message of changing our whole way of thinking in order to let go of missing the mark comes not to Emperor Tiberius, not to Pontius Pilate, not to Herod, not to any of the high priests or rulers of the day, but the word of God comes to an overlooked guy on the margins named John. I hear today's message saying that we will see the most unlikely of characters, including ourselves. You guys are characters. <laughs> Having a central role in peacemaking. Each of us being people who commit to alternatives to violence rather than idly hoping that God will make our lives peaceful while violence continues all around us. This is the proclamation of John the Baptist. Preparing the way is zooming out and seeing salvation together and together seeing that salvation is for all. Now last Sunday we had a baptism. A friend of ours named Zena was baptized and she wanted to be baptized by immersion. And so we went over to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church to use their baptismal pool. And a good handful of our church family was there. And Zena and I stood in the baptismal waters. And we had all these bright, shining faces looking back at us. And I, I said a few words about how Zena's baptism wasn't just for her, but it served as a reminder to all of us of our communal commitment to following Jesus Christ and to, in doing so, accepting the joys and the cost of that discipleship. I talked about how when the world tells us that God only has so much love to go around, that God finds us in spite of all that talk and then fills our cup to overflowing with that love and then invites us to a life of recognizing limitations to that great love for all that exists in our everyday world and then working to change those violent systems. And then with one hand on Zena's face and one hand on her back. I baptized her in the name of the Creator and of the Christ and of the Holy Spirit. And Zena's foot slipped and I almost went down with her into the water. <laughs> and she came up out of that water smiling and laughing and all flesh saw it together. And we were so happy. Good moment. And in that gathering, of about 30 or 40 people, there was a nine-year-old boy named David, a member of this church. And when I got out of the water and I dried off and I changed clothes, David came up to me with a piece of paper that he wanted me to have. And David's mom and I talked, and she and I agreed, and David agreed that it would be helpful to share this with you. So here goes. Um, how many of us have ever seen a counselor before? Yep. Counselors are great. I saw a counselor when I was having nightmares when I was a little boy. I saw a counselor when I was getting picked on in middle school. Stacy and I saw a counselor when, before we got married. 
counselors can be so helpful. So David handed me this piece of paper. It was a plan, a covenant, let's call it, that he and his counselor had made together. David, at nine years of age, is having a tough time when people say mean things to him or he sees hurtful things happening around him. It upsets him. And just like any of us, he struggles with what to do with that hurt and what to do with those mean things that he experiences and that he takes in. How much of that do we take in that we haven't even acknowledged to date, right? And David doesn't want to contribute to that. He doesn't want to contribute to a cycle of violence. And so his counselor and he came up with some alternatives to conflict and put it on paper. And David listened, he, uh, on the paper he listed some adults that he could talk to if he ever felt overwhelmed by these hurtful things. And he wrote down some things that he could do to take his mind off of hurting himself or hurting other people. And some things that he could do in his daily life to create peace. I'll pet Mr. Pete. I'll read a book. I'll play a video game because I want to become a video game engineer. And he wrote, I'll pray. And then David said, look at the pictures that I drew on the back. And he explained every single one of them to me. That's the dove with the branch in its mouth. And that's the cross. And that's the boulder that got rolled away from Jesus' tomb. And that's the rainbow in the clouds. And those marks coming out of the rainbow are God's voice speaking out of the rainbow. And to David, the story that he'd drawn was just as important as the commitment he'd made to change things. I've been keeping that piece of paper folded up in my coat pocket as these days are getting colder. Can we hear the voice of a child standing at the edge of the waters of baptism, crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make peace by committing to a whole new way of thinking so that you would let go of anything that keeps you from loving your neighbor as you love yourself? For that is a reflection of the love that God has for us all. In the 15th year of the 21st century, when Barack Obama was president of the United States, and Greg Abbott was governor of Texas, and Jason Bianski was mayor of the city of Bryan, and Nancy Berry was mayor of College Station, and Pope Francis presided as the 266th Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, and Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer was elected the ninth general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. The word of the Lord came to a nine-year-old boy named David. To prepare the way of the Lord is to see those the world overlooks and to listen to what they have to say. To prepare the way of the Lord is to see those the world overlooks, including the voice of God that speaks in you and through you. What is that voice whispering to you today? How is that voice inviting you to change your whole way of thinking. Let peace on earth begin, O God, and let it begin with me. Amen.